If you're thinking about starting your own Apple Smart Home, but not sure where to begin or what HomeKit even is, well, this video is a beginner's guide to HomeKit in 2023. So whether you're new to the whole Smart Home world and HomeKit and want to start buying your own Smart Home devices to build up your own Smart Home, or if you just want to learn more about HomeKit, then this video is for you. In this video, I'll break down exactly what HomeKit is, walk you through the Home app and show you how it works, and some fun ways to automate your Smart Home. So by the end of the video, you'll have a better understanding of what HomeKit is, how it works, and be able to start your own smart home. So what exactly is HomeKit? HomeKit is a smart home platform designed by Apple that allows you to control compatible smart home devices like smart bulbs or smart plugs with Apple devices, including the iPhone, iPad, Mac, Apple TV, Apple Watch, and with using Siri. It's similar to Amazon having and Google having the Google Home platform. HomeKit is also a framework that allows third-party companies to create smart home devices that can be controlled by Apple devices by becoming HomeKit certified. Speaking of HomeKit devices, what is a HomeKit device? Well, there are two types of devices that you need to know about. That's native and non-native or bridged devices. A native HomeKit device means that it works with Apple HomeKit and the Home app right out of the box. Any device with the works with Apple HomeKit logo or the new Apple Home badge on the box is a native HomeKit device. There are many different types of devices that can work with HomeKit, including cameras, lights, outlets, sensors, locks, and more. Apple has a small lineup of their own smart devices as well, including the Apple TV and the HomePod and the HomePod mini. And you will actually need at least one of these Apple devices in your HomeKit smart home. I'll explain why later on. There's also devices that support Apple AirPlay, which allows you to share videos, photos, music, and more from your Apple devices to your Apple TV, compatible speakers, along with the ability to mirror what's on your screen to a bigger screen. Some native devices require a bridge or a hub to get the device to work with HomeKit. A common example of this is the brand Philips Hue. Philips Hue makes smart bulbs and other smart devices that don't natively work with HomeKit, but the Philips Hue bridge does, and the Philips Hue bulbs talk to the Philips Hue bridge and allow the bulbs to work with HomeKit automatically. Now, in order for a device to work with HomeKit natively, it does have to be certified by Apple and undergo a strict and extensive certification process. Native HomeKit devices are more expensive, but also more secure. Now, there are some types of devices that are not supported in HomeKit in general. This would include appliances like fridges, ovens, smart displays, and vacuums, which is where having non-native devices come into play. A non-native smart device does not natively work with HomeKit, but with a third-party bridge, it can support Apple's HomeKit. This includes Google devices, Ring products, vacuums, and more by using a third-party bridge like HomeBridge or the Star Hub. These third-party bridges are often cheaper than native HomeKit devices, but they are not HomeKit certified and not approved by Apple. So they still do work in HomeKit, but you will see a message in HomeKit saying that it's not certified and may not work well. So. How do all these devices connect to the Apple Home app? Well, there's four different protocols that a device can use, starting with the oldest, Bluetooth. Bluetooth is commonly used for pairing wireless devices like headphones or speakers to your phone, but this protocol is not great to use with smart home devices. It's an older connection type and does not have long connection range, often leading to slow response times and are very unreliable. Next is Wi-Fi, and this is the most common connection type. A Wi-Fi device joins the same network as your other Wi-Fi enabled devices, like phones, tablets, TVs, and more. And it has a much wider connection range. Though because of this, it can congest your network, especially if you have a lot of devices and can slow down other devices that are on your network. And if you don't have a strong or more up-to-date router, then it can cause smart devices to fall off the network, though not always. The third connection type is Zigbee, and this is often used in devices that require a bridge. The bridge connects to your home internet over Wi-Fi or Ethernet, and the specific devices connect to the bridge. So well-known brands like Acara and Philips Hue use Zigbee. Devices that require a hub are often more reliable than Wi-Fi only connected devices, since they don't have to compete for a signal with your other wireless devices and connect directly to their respective bridge. Then there is Thread, a protocol designed specifically for smart home devices. Thread devices create a mesh network between each other and each device helps extend the thread signal all throughout your house. So the network becomes stronger as you add more thread enabled devices. You will need a thread board router like an Apple TV 4K or a HomePod. Otherwise the connection drops to a slow Bluetooth connection. There's a lot of thread enabled devices on the market today from brands like Eve, Nanoleaf and more on the way. And then there's this new smart home standard that you've probably heard of recently. 
Matter. Matter is not a specific wireless protocol like Wi Fi or Thread. Matter supports Wi Fi and Thread. Without getting too technical, Matter is a language that all smart home devices speak to each other that allows the devices to now work with all smart home platforms. And Thread or Wi Fi is the mode of how devices communicate the language. Matter devices can still use Wi Fi or Thread as their primary connection. Matter just allows the device to work with all smart home platforms. Some brands already make smart devices that work with all platforms, like Maris or Philips Hue, but some brands only make devices that work with a specific platform, like Eve just worked with Apple HomeKit. But now with Matter, devices can work with all platforms right out of the box, meaning you could buy an Eve smart plug and use it in the Amazon or Google ecosystem, something that could not be done before. And now, devices that did not support HomeKit before now can work with HomeKit, like the Google Nest thermostat and smart speaker. Previously, you wouldn't need to have a hub like the Starling Hub to get it to work with HomeKit. All of these devices can be controlled from the free Apple Home app, available on all Apple devices. That comes pre-installed on any iPhone, or you can download it from the App Store. The Home app is one single central app that you use to control and manage all your smart home devices from various companies. Instead of using multiple apps to control your smart home. So if you have smart bulbs from Philips Hue, smart plugs from Maris, and centers by Acara, instead of using multiple individual apps to control these devices, you can use just one app the Apple Home app to control them all. However, I would still recommend downloading the manufacturer's app for all your devices because you won't get all the features in Apple HomeKit that you would get in the manufacturer's app. More on that later on. Here's a brief walkthrough of the Apple Home app and how it all works. So once you open up the Home app, you will see three tabs at the bottom, Home, Automation, and Discover. Let's start off with Home. This is the main view to see the status and control your devices. At the top is the status view. This is where you can quickly access and check the status of various categories categories of devices, starting with climate. This includes things like thermostats, temperature and humidity sensors, and more. Here you can see if I tap on temperature, I can see the temperature of a room from my thermostat and one of my HomePods. I have a smart plug that controls a fan that's here as well. You can configure what device appears here as well if you don't want to see the status of every sensor. Next is lights. So here you can see any lights or smart plugs that are labeled as lights that are on and you can tap to turn them on or off. Then you have security, which includes smart locks, door sensors, and cameras. Next is speakers and TVs, which shows you anything that's playing on an Apple TV, a HomeKit TV, or a HomePod, or other AirPlay compatible speaker. And then there's water for leak sensors. Next you have a section for cameras, and this is any security camera that you may have. You can scroll across to view them all and make this tile here bigger or smaller, and tap the arrow to view all your cameras, and tap one to view the live feed. Below the cameras is scenes, and this is a group of devices that run a specific action or command all at once. These are great for controlling multiple devices at once. For example, I have a goodnight scene that turns most of my devices off in my entire house and turns on specific devices in the bedroom and the home pods will automatically play music. These scenes can be ran in multiple ways. <clears throat> you can use them in automations by tapping them here in the app and with Siri on a home pod. Under the scene area is your rooms and this is an area where the device is located. So here in my house, I have a couple rooms. The devices that you see here are devices set to show on the main view. This may not be all the devices that you have in the actual room. If I tap the name of the room, it takes me to the specific room. And here's the status view at the top of the devices specifically in this room. You can see the cameras in this room, run your scenes, and see all the devices that are in this room, separated by categories like lights, locks, and more. There's also zones, which is a group of rooms. So you could have a zone called main floor that includes the kitchen room and the living room. And you can use Siri to control all the devices in that zone, like saying, turn off all the lights on the main floor. To control a device, there's a couple things that you can do. You can tap the icon on the left to toggle the power if the device supports power on and off, or you can tap to the right of the icon and it'll open up the settings of the device. And here you can control specific settings of the device, like changing the name or the icon to better represent what the device is. The features you get in the home app does vary by device. For example, if it's a light, you can control the power, the brightness, and the color if you have a color bulb. A smart plug would have power on and off. A dimmer switch would be a light and have the ability to adjust the brightness. And TVs would have the ability to change the input. Now, unfortunately, not all features of a device are supported in the Apple Home app. A good example of this is smart cameras. If you have a smart camera with the ability to pan or tilt or move around the room, the directional control feature is not supported in the Apple Home app. 
As you can tell, the ability to control your smart home from just your phone is truly incredible. And you can take your experience even further with automations. There are some crazy automations that you can create that are truly magical. But before we look at those, you know what else is magical? an iPhone case. And the folks over at Casecoo, who is sponsoring today's video, sent over their Magic Stand series iPhone case that not only has an incredibly nice design with excellent build quality, a shockproof design, and military drop protection, but it also has this hidden magnetic kickstand that makes holding your phone much easier. The stand can be adjusted from 40 degrees to about 120 degrees, which is perfect because I like to watch videos about new home kit products while I eat, and I can easily adjust the viewing angle so it's easier to see. The stand can also be used in portrait mode, which has come in handy to just control the devices in my smart home from the home app. And if I need to view a camera, I can easily switch to landscape mode and adjust the viewed angle from here. This is really cool. My favorite part though, is the case is MagSafe compatible. So when my phone is low on battery, I can just attach my MagSafe charger and the phone will start to charge without me having to remove the phone case. The cases come in different styles and colors for all iPhone models. So you can mix and match colors for your phone. And CaseQ just launched a new payment method with Klarna, where you can pay for your entire order over time with no interest instead of having to pay all at once. And if you use my code ADAMTECHLIFE10, then you can take 10% off your order. Check out my affiliate link down in the description below, and a huge thanks to Kesku for sponsoring today's video. Now let's look at how you can use automations in your smart home. So what exactly is an automation? Well, at its core, an automation is essentially automatically controlling the smart devices in your home to make your life easier. A basic example is you can put a contact sensor on a door and and have a smart light in your room. So whenever the door is opened, the sensor will tell the light to turn on without you having to flip a switch. So here in the home app, the middle tab here is for automations. Now there are two things that you need to know about whenever it comes to automations, and that's triggers and conditions. A trigger is something that happens to start the automation, and there are four different types of triggers. Each of these triggers have their own conditions. And conditions are optional restrictions that the automation will check for whenever it's running an automation. And one of my personal favorite automations is whenever I get home, my door will automatically unlock and all my lights will turn on. I have a playlist on my channel of a bunch of automation ideas if you want to see more. There's also Siri shortcuts, which are a bit more complex, but really takes automating to the next level. More on this in a different video. Now, in order for automations to run, you will need a HomeKit hub, which can either be an Apple TV, a HomePod, or a HomePod mini or an iPad. Keep in mind that a HomeKit hub is different than a hub or a bridge from a manufacturer, like with Philips Hue. A HomeKit hub is used specifically inside of the HomeKit ecosystem and used for automations, remote control, and viewing of smart devices from anywhere. A hub from a manufacturer allows the device to work with HomeKit. A Philips Hue hub cannot be your Apple HomeKit hub. Now you can still have a Apple smart home without a HomeKit hub. You just won't be able to run any automations or control any devices remotely. You can still control your devices, but only whenever you are physically in range of the devices. So you may be thinking, what HomeKit hub should I actually get? Well, the Apple TV 4K with Ethernet is the most reliable since it supports Ethernet and Thread, and a hardware connection is always better than a wireless one, but a HomePod is a great second option as well. I would definitely avoid using an iPad because for one, an iPad is not supported as a hub with the new home architecture update that supports Matter devices. And two, because being that an iPad is battery powered, if your iPad goes offline, then your hub will be down. You could have your iPad plugged into the wall charging, but a HomePod mini would be better at that point. Unfortunately, if you have multiple hubs like multiple Apple TVs and multiple HomePods, then the Home app will automatically choose your hub for you and you cannot manually change it. So if you have a wired Apple TV and a wireless HomePod, then the Home app may choose the wireless device over the more reliable wired hub for whatever reason. So at that point, it doesn't really matter which device is your HomeKit hub. The choice really comes down to, do you want a streaming device or a smart speaker? And finally, in the Apple Home app is the third tab, the Discover tab, which basically explains how HomeKit works, what's required, and all the different types of devices that you can buy. There are some customization features in the Home app as well you're able to rearrange or even resize these tiles if you'd rather have some tiles be bigger or smaller in either the room page and in the home page. The home view layout can be changed as well. So if you want to have your cameras at the bottom instead of the top, then you can do that. Or the rooms can be arranged in any order that you like. The wallpaper of each room or the home page can be changed with some pre-made options or you can upload your own photo. Unfortunately, these wallpapers do not sync across devices. So if you set a wallpaper on your iPhone, it will not sync to the iPad. You have to change it manually on each device. 
There's also the ability to share your home with somebody. This could be a spouse, a family member, or anybody you'd like to have access to control your devices, which sounds great, but there are very few restrictions when it comes to sharing. You can't choose specific rooms or specific devices that you want to share or not share. So maybe you'd want, say, a child or a guest to only have access to control devices in one specific room and no other devices in the house. Well, when it comes to sharing, it's pretty much all or nothing. There really is no in-between. There are residents, which is basically full access, and then there's guests, which is only allowed access to secure accessories like smart locks and not other devices. When it comes to building your own smart home, one important factor that you need to keep in mind is privacy. How well is your data being protected? Especially if you have smart cameras, you know, who can see all my footage? Let's look how Apple specifically protects your privacy. Apple is known for the strongest privacy and security, especially when it comes to camera footage with HomeKit Secure Video, which is Apple's cloud recording for HomeKit cameras that will encrypt your footage from the last 10 days on your HomeKit hub, then securely upload it to your iCloud account. A paid iCloud storage plan is required, but the recordings won't count against your iCloud storage plan. And only you and the people that you share your cameras with will have access to the live stream and past recordings. In fact, Apple does not even have access to your cameras or any of the devices inside your smart home. Brands are adding more privacy features into their products as well. With a HomePod, you're able to turn off the mic, so Siri will only hear you when you actually press and hold on the top of the HomePod. Some cameras now have physical buttons to turn off the camera, or the lens can physically roll back for better privacy. If you have multiple Apple devices, like an iPhone or an iPad, then the HomeKit ecosystem is the ideal ecosystem for you. But maybe you only have an iPhone and want to add more devices over time. Well, the great thing about Apple devices is they can all work together to provide a secure, easy to use, and overall the best experience. Like you're able to control an Apple TV hands-free with just a HomePod, or even pair multiple HomePods to an Apple TV for stereo sound. And on the iPhone and the iPad, there's a stripped down version of the Home app in Control Center for quick viewing and control of devices, as well as the ability to control HomePods, Apple TVs, and speakers from Control Center. If you have any questions about HomeKit or start in your own smart home, comment your question down below and I will answer it. Thank you for watching this video and I'll see y'all in the next one.